بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبع سنته إلى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome again to another episode of your weekly Islamic chat show Guest of the Week coming to you from Sharjah TV As always, I'm your host Ismail Bullock And today we want to talk about some important advice that we can give to our children or we can take away and implement when it comes to uh, teaching or bring up our children based upon the advice of Luqman to his son and to do that with me is brother Muhammad Khan Assalamu alaikum Wa alaikum salam So uh, that's it. actually if you think about it it's an important topic because uh, a lot of us have children and especially in today's uh, day and age it's very difficult in many ways to know how to bring up your children and so we're going to take away some important points or advices based upon the advice as we know from the Quran of Luqman to his son. Alhamdulillah, salatu wassalam ala rasulillah. Uh, firstly, if you look at uh, the role of the parents, uh, of course, we will touch upon a specific element from the advices of Luqman, uh, which are mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Luqman. However, if we just see a brief outlook of the role of parents, and what is their responsibility? So they have a major responsibility upon them regarding their children. And as the Prophet Sallallahu he mentioned that every one of you is a shepherd of his flock. So everyone has a responsibility and he will be asked about the flock on the day of resurrection. So a man is responsible for his women folk, for his children, for his uh, you know, family members. Even a woman is responsible for her children, for her husband's property and so on and so forth for, for our family members. Coming to the aspect of children, uh, especially in this day and age, in this rapidly changing times, uh, we have to get our focus right regarding upbringing our children and regarding parenting because we find a lot of distractions today uh, when it comes to parenting and when it comes to uh, the aspect of children becoming uh, deviated or children not listening to parents, children becoming disobedient. This is this is a major problem in the society. And subhanAllah, in some of the places, we see that uh, the children can uh, are basically getting their parents to jail or getting them in trouble. Or the children, once they become, uh, you know, uh, yani they're working, they get married, they take their parents and put them in old age homes. And this is it. I've, I've even heard really crazy stories like that actually legally happened where the child divorces his parents without mentioning any particular names. But there, there was a famous Hollywood child star who was uh, in many movies uh, as a child. And as he got older, uh, he actually went to court and officially divorced his parents. <laughs> so subhanAllah, crazy. I, quite, so a lot of weird things are happening. And we see that a lot of people uh, from a young age now, they fall into the trap of drugs, women, addiction, and so many things where parents, subhanAllah, sometimes are unaware about that or sometimes they don't know how to cope up with the situation and they don't know like uh, what has gone wrong. Uh, so basically, it, it is a challenge and it is a test as Allah mentioned in the Quran that our families, our properties, our children, they are a test for us. They are a test and we must, uh, you know, adopt ourselves for this test. It could be uh, in different way and different forms for different people. Like someone might be tested in their children uh, through maybe an illness or through a sickness. Uh, someone might be tested by, uh, you know, their children not being on the guidance. Uh, but again, when it comes to this aspect of uh, bringing children, we must take our precautions, we must do our uh, responsibilities and fulfill our responsibilities and then uh, along with that trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have tawakkul in Allah. No one can say that, you know, my child, he just uh, you know, deviated, he's into drugs, he doesn't pray, he's, uh, you know, not a Muslim. It just happened by the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, what is our role and responsibility as parents? That is also very important. If one has done it, if one took all the measures required and followed the guidance of Quran and Sunnah in bringing children, then 
if a child goes, which is very rare, which is like, uh, you know, uh, usually unheard. Like if parents, they gave good therbia, they gave good teachings to their children, it's very rare uh, that, you know, children might deviate. It's, it's like uh, maybe one in a million or Allahu Alam. I don't know the figures, so I won't, I won't mention because uh, I don't usually hear about this. Most of the times, the problem is in the upbringing, in the tarbiyah, and people not understanding what, what the problem is and where the problem is. And of course, uh, you know, we will uh, be asked about our children. Uh, the Prophet said, كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٍ رَعَيَتِهِ That all of you are like a, a shepherd or a carer, and all of you will be asked about his flock or those under his care. And ultimately, this is talking about the... Uh, uh, children and we know there's a verse that says Qu anfusukum wa ahlikum nara. save yourself and your family from the hellfire so there's definitely like you mentioned this active part where us as parents have to make an effort that's right uh, because sadly now the, w what we see the trend is that uh, from a father's perspective or from a mother's perspective uh, children uh, they are given a very uh, what you call it, a traditional upbringing in terms of whatever is happening, and yani go with the flow. So a child, he might, uh, you know, once he grows up, they might, you know, put him in a school. So he goes to the school for eight to 10 hours, then he comes back, then uh, he's given maybe his uh, games and computer games, then he goes to coaching, he comes back, sleeps, doesn't meet the father, doesn't interact with the mother, for his homework, everything, he's left to the coaching classes, and who he's playing with, who are his friends, what games is he accessing, what is he watching on internet, what is taught to him in the school. All of these things are kept away from the parents. And they think, yes, he is in a prestigious school and he's getting good upbringing. Whereas they don't know what is he taught, what type of friends is he interacting in the school in the first place and what teachings are given to him. Because we find sadly so many people, they are getting... Uh, drug addicted or smoking or drinking from their friends in schools or colleges it comes from their friends whereas the parents they were not aware of whom their child was interacting with or it might be some you know some gangster you know who just uh, influences the child so similarly there's no active participation of parents in the upbringing in the tarbiya and this needs to be changed this mindset needs to be changed we need to come out of this state where we think okay he's studying now, after 15 years, he passes school, and then again, another four years, he's in, uh, doing his degree. His, and then, yeah, we think the, the, uh, yeah, I mean, everything uh, is about grades now. So parents, they think, okay, if their child gets good grades, this is it. This is good parenting. And if he fails, then there's pressure put on him. So, you know, things are going in uh, not the correct direction as it should be going. Parenting is basically an active participation of tarbiyah of the child. Uh, it's not just that uh, he's put in a good school. Okay, that is an element, could be an element of that. Or he's, uh, you know, given this food, shelter, clothing. These are basically elements of good parenting, but this is not it. There are more to it, which we will see and which has been told to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before that, uh, we also must understand that how to get to that point, basically. Now that we see the, the, the trend is that people are, aren't aware like, as to what is supposed to be done, what is basically tarbiyah. How do we reach to that point? Number one is that as parents, we must seek knowledge. And as parents, we must seek knowledge and implement it in our lives. So if we do not know, there's no harm in that. Uh, everyone is not born as a, a, a scholar or knowledgeable person. People learn. So there's no harm in learning and we have so many good examples like uh, when I see a lot of uh, reverts uh, you know they might revert at a specific age maybe 35 40 45 50 and then they start learning and then they go on to become maybe you know, graduates and scholars and then PhDs and subhanAllah this is something where we know that learning is not just limited to your school days or university days learning is a lifelong process you know where we learn about things and subhanallah nowadays we have everything 
so easily accessible. We have courses, we have uh, workshops, everything's online, everything is uh, at our fingertips. We can easily, uh, you know, know, okay, what is good, what is bad. There are so many uh, articles, journals about parenting, about what is good in terms of fitness, in terms of uh, he good health for the child, what is good for him, so many things. So in terms of tarbiyah, we must learn, we must seek knowledge. And not to forget the primary thing is learn about the Islamic methods of parenting. Islamic methods of parenting as to what is required from us and what are we supposed to do towards our children. <clears throat> I mean, also, if you, if you look in the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu you'll see there's many examples where he, the way he spoke to children, the way he instructed them, the way he uh, generally interacted with them. And there's, there's very good examples that we can use uh, with our children, with children in general. That's right. Uh, also, like th there has to be steadfastness and you know patience required from our end towards the children because uh, we see a lot of uh, parents you know getting uh, violent or getting you know uh, hitting their children or beating their children and, and this is not this is not the solution actually uh, this leads to more problems. So what is supposed to be understood here is that we must be steadfast, seek knowledge, implement it in your life, and Whatever we want our child to be, or children to be, we must be that in the first place. So if someone wants his child to pray, but he sleeps in Fajr, and he misses his Isha, he's sitting in front of the TV uh, while Isha Iqama is going on, how will his child you know, uh, become uh, someone who prays? And I always see, uh, subhanAllah, like uh, there are some children you know, which come to uh, a nearby mosque, and I see them there of the age of five or six, basically seven. They wear, uh, uh, yani, always come with their father. And they wear this nice thobe. They have this shimag. And they stand in prayer sometimes, you know, with khushu and with such firmness. Whereas some of the elders might be, you know, shaking, making movements. And they're at peace in Fajr, in other places. And I see them. And this is basically uh, the tarbiyah of their father. Yeah, and he's getting them to the masjid and even in Fajr, it's not that they're coming and they're uneasy or they're all at ease and they're there in the first half, they're sitting there. SubhanAllah, this is something. So this tarbiya starts uh, from, uh, you know, day one. Uh, uh, another thing you kind of reminded me of when it comes to children is we see lots of people, which obviously is good, but they send their children to memorize the Quran in these Quran classes. But in reality, when they go home, you know, there's not much of Islam being practiced. So that child, even though he memorized the Quran, he generally doesn't benefit from it because his tarbiyah or his, the way he's being brought up or his home situation could be movies and music all day long and not really praying. And, you know, so him going to those Quran classes don't have the effect they should have because when he, he's there for a couple of hours, but all the other hours at home, he's not doing anything, not going to the masjid, not, you know, so then yeah. it doesn't have the positive effect it's supposed to have. That's right. And that same applies, as you said, you know, so people want their children to become uh, hafiz of the Quran or they want them to be good qaris. But in, in the house, there's music and there's movies and all of these things. Uh, on the other hand, a mother, she might want, my daughter should wear hijab, but she herself you know, goes out without hijab. So these are things which needs to be fixed. We cannot, if a man is sitting smoking in his house, uh, he must, you know, uh, expect that his child will also go out and smoke, maybe in hiding or here and there, because he sees his father and the first role models are parents, mothers and fathers. <clears throat> Hold you on that point there. We're just going to go for a break. Join us after this break. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Now, just before the break, you know, you mentioned that if the child sees the parents doing these bad things, they'll pick it up from them. And it reminds me of a, a saying that's quite common, which is, you know, really reality, a silly statement, is do as I say, not as, something along the lines of do as I say, not as I do. So say to the child, do what I tell you, don't do what I do. 
uh, of course, in, in reality, for the child or us as people and our parents, of course, the parents may tell you to do something. They may have problems themselves. So it doesn't mean that because... But the general thing is, as a general principle, that you can, you know, it's not the right thing to say to the child who sees you doing these things over and over again, like, do as I say, not as I do. Mm. They will pick these things up from you and they will, it will have an effect on, like you said. He may not smoke in front of the, the parent who smokes all the time because he knows the parent might give him a beating, for example. But because he sees the parent doing it, it kind of rubs off on him. And like you said, he starts to secretly do it. That's right. So uh, it's, it's uh, basically, you know, we learn things, implement it, and remain steadfast on that. And the most important thing is that we exhibit or we display what we want our children to be. Uh, implement it in life, it's, it's never too late. So if someone who is not a practicing Muslim or maybe a couple, they're not practicing Muslims, they are not praying or similar things, they must adopt these things, uh, you know, before it's too late. Because people, they want to be in their, uh, this frenzy state that, okay, uh, let, he's still small, my child is still small. And once he grows big, once she grows big, once they reach puberty or once they are 16, 18, 20, once they pass out from university, then I will teach them about Islam. Then I will teach them about morals, ethics. Then I will, you know, teach them about Quran and these things. This is not how it works. Yani it's too late at that time. We start the tarbiya as per their age appropriateness. So when a child is two years, three years. Now, today, modern psychologists and modern researchers, they tell us that, you know, the teaching a child it, it uh, begins as soon as, you know, the child is one year plus something of that sort because he sees things, he adopts, he analyzes, and it's, it's, it's uh, there. So as per that age, we teach the child and we keep and set the atmosphere. So you don't want to, uh, you know, busy the child with uh, too many games and uh, digital games and music and this and that. And he leaves on his other productive habits. And this is where parents they play a major role because what people want just to shut the child many a time. You know, the child, maybe he's crying or he wants them. They shut him by putting him some cartoons or giving him some video games. And then the mother's to her work and the father's to his work. This is not how, uh, you know, Tarbiya is done. There has to be active involvement and keeping the child busy in things which are productive and which leads to uh, goodness. I mean, uh, it's true. I mean, what you just said reminded me of, an, uh, like you said, that nowadays that so many of the children, they are just given uh, uh, tablets or uh, mobile phones. And they're just, even from a young age, like a one-year-old, he's just given the iPad or the tablet to scroll for hours. Okay, there may be some things that are good for the, they say that some of these things that you can put on these pads, they have intellectual benefit. You know, that the child can prime, even from a young age, he can maybe click on this and it teaches him coordination and problem solving and it can be good for their intelligence. Okay, but we know generally speaking, they're just watching cartoons non-stop or they're just watching bright lights or whatever it is for hours and hours. Apart from the fact it's not good for their eyesight, it's not good, you know, like you said, they're just given these gadgets for hours, even from such a young age. Yeah, and there are some researchers also done that, you know, a child, uh, he is exposed to thousands and thousands of uh, videos of content online, which is violent, which is uh, sexual in content, and these things. And then this corrupts his, uh, you know, basic psychology. And this, uh, you know, affects him in the wrong sense. So therefore, we must take care of these uh, things, which we consider to be small, but they are actually uh, major. Uh, before we move ahead and before we look at the advisors, uh, last but not the least, we must learn and apply the right techniques depending on the situation and not be too uh, influenced by our tradition or uh, people around us. So many times this happens that uh, a couple might want to implement or do things good for their children and upbring them upon a uh, you know, right course and upon Islam, make them righteous. But then there is a lot of outside pressure sometimes, maybe from one side of the family, maybe from friends, maybe. So we need to know that for us to keep the atmosphere in our house, 
and in our family good, <clears throat> we need to remove the distractions. So if there is some distraction coming in the house from outside source, we need to uh, remove that distraction or we need to, you know, fix that, uh, whatever is coming. Sometimes, you know, it's some third person who's coming in the house, uh, maybe coming and giving the child, you know, something which has music in it. And then the child gets, uh, you know, used to it. Maybe uh, it might be a toy or maybe sometimes a tab or something of that sort. Similarly, uh, things which are taught to the children. So when there are other relatives or other friends and family members, what they teach the children, it has to be in line with what the parents decide because the parents are uh, basically responsible for the children. And whatever is taught to the children, whatever is taught uh, or conveyed to the children, which affects them, has to be monitored and has to be uh, approved basically by the parents uh, if it is not something which is uh, done right. So applying the right discipline techniques, inshallah, will get us results and will uh, help our children become uh, better human beings. <clears throat> uh, like you mentioned, you know, it's important as well not to give in to sometimes what may have become to some extent normal in society or with some people normal, that you then give in because you say, oh, well, you know, I don't want to look like I'm being like too strict or, you know, everyone else is doing it. And what I can remember is that one time I went, I went to a particular place where they were doing some kind of water sports and there was a, an individual there and he was, you know, who was in charge of it. And he was saying to like, bring your children. And he obviously was a Muslim. And I was like, OK, it sounds interesting. But uh, I, I could see from a distance in the background that there were women walking around in bikinis. So I said to him, is there a time they can come where they, these women wouldn't be around? I said, you know, thinking he'll understand what I'm saying completely. And he, and he said to me like, oh, you've really like, like the, the best way to explain it is he said like, you've, you've really cut them off. or you're, you're really strict on them. You've locked them up. I said, no, they do like so many things. I said, but you know, I don't want them to be mixing. And he's like, oh, no, don't worry, my son. You know, he's been mixing with these women with bikinis now since he was like uh, 10. He doesn't even think about it, doesn't even... And I said to myself, that's what you think. <laughs> you can guarantee this guy, this kid has got some all kind of like, probably like uh, over-hormonized -hor -horm thoughts okay. and stuff going on there. And, you know, because, you know, but to him, hey, my son, you know, he's been with them since he was 11. He doesn't even blink mm. when he sees a woman in a bikini. So this is the thing as well, because... It's important not to give in to those pressures because you may be like sometimes so many people around you are doing these things, letting their children do these things that you just feel like, oh, you just go with the flow. But it's important not to, you know, it's important to kind of like stand Firm. to the correct morals that you know is correct, you know. Uh, and we know, is, we know in reality, Islam is the middle path. We don't go to, to this extreme or that extreme. It's the middle path. So you know that if Islam tells you to avoid this or avoid that, that is the middle path, and it's there for a reason. That's right. And Savannah, you give a very practical example. This is, this is what must be applied in all other things, whether it comes to uh, any specific game or sport, or when it comes to food, also in that sense that <clears throat> there are certain harmful foods which are you know, just uh, given to the children and uh, which is not actually good for their health. Similarly, in other things, in other teaching, in character and behavior and language, where people who don't have that background, they think yeah, this is too extreme. Whereas in the true sense, it's not. It's not actually extreme and Islam is basically the middle path. Uh, if we now look at uh, the Quranic uh, verses and if we look at the Surah, Surah Luqman, over here Allah SWT mentions about Luqman, who was a wise person, who was a wise man. And Allah gives us the examples what he gave to his child, the advices he gave to his child. Basically, uh, these are uh, derived and these are seven advices which are given to his child. And we will, inshallah, go through these seven advices. And let us look at what are the advices given by him and where do we stand? This is for ourselves and for the viewers. Where do we stand? And take these advices and implement in our lives for uh, better tarbiyah and for our children to be on the right track. The first advice, uh, this is uh, uh, for the viewers by the Surah Luqman, Surah number 31, so that people can read it and they can, you know, refer to it. Surah Luqman, Surah number 31. So the first advice which Luqman gave to his son was that, Ya Bunayya, 
لا تشرق بالله إن إن الشرك لا ظلم عظيم. That O my son, do not associate partners with Allah. Verily, associating partners with Allah is indeed a great ظلم. It's a great injustice. And here we see that the first thing which is being taught is about Allah and not associating partners with Allah. This is again the primary for a human being, for a child, for a man, a woman, anyone. And as we have discussed previously many times, this is the fitra. This is in our fitra to worship one Allah alone. No matter wherever we are, whichever country we are in, whatever our background and region is, this is in our nature to worship Allah alone and not associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether it is associ association through associating a human being, a prophet, a saint in the grave, or uh, you know, some righteous person, or through any, any means, or through by associating idols and so on and so forth. Allah alone deserves to be worshipped and this is what has to be instilled in the minds of children. This has to be taught from an early age that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is supposed to be worshipped alone. And the purpose of our life, you know, that we are here to worship Allah alone. Now, when this is given to the children, whatever follows next will be, inshallah, on track, will be intact. Because now the foundation is being laid. The foundation is that uh, we worship Allah. We do not associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is basic foundation. Once this is done, then the rest things will become much and much easier. And uh, we also see uh, from the life of the Prophet وسلم, where once he was with Ibn Abbas, who was a young boy, and the Prophet وسلم, advised him. They both were uh, going, and the Prophet وسلم, advised him, and he told him that, O oh son, if you were to ask, ask only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't ask anyone else. If you were to pray and if you were to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask only from Allah. Whatever you want, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what the Prophet sallallahu is, you know, basically modeling the child. On the other hand, he said, if any, everyone got together and they were to harm you, they couldn't harm you except what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed. And these are things when our children know about, they will be strong and firm in the faith. The fitna and the trials of, you know, doubts and of desires uh, which are out there. So nowadays we see that uh, atheism is on the rise and people going, uh, you know, getting doubts and people are falling in the traps of atheism. The young children where, you know, they don't know about the religion. They were not taught as to who is Allah and what are we supposed to do? What is the purpose of our life? And this is what happens. So when we teach our children about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we make them firm in Tawheed, and when we tell them about the consequences of shirk and what shirk is, this is the foundation. This has to be taught through different techniques, different methods, uh, according to age appropriateness, but this has to be taught to them. So here we see that Luqman, he is teaching his son that do not worship Allah. This is indeed a great dhulm. And moreover, uh, we want to also touch on the aspect that uh, many people they think that you know uh, Tawheed I'll just hold you on that point there because <coughs> that's an important point to discuss in detail join us after this short break Assalamu <laughs> alaikum and welcome back now, just before the break, you were starting to uh, explain the importance of, of, of Tawheed, of the oneness of Allah, the worshipping of Allah alone. Yeah, uh, what, what happens is like uh, most of the times people they come up with uh, an idea that uh, why so much emphasis and why so much stress on Tawheed and about this branch uh, where we teach about the oneness of Allah. This is basically our foundation in Islam. And when we see in the past and in the present and this will be the case in the future uh, at, based on uh, you know textual evidence that people and groups they go deviated because they didn't understand Tawheed well they didn't understand the correct concept of God they didn't understand uh, the correct element of Aqidah so this is the primary reason of people deviating and even today in current situation we see a lot of individuals or groups 
when they deviate, it is because of a distorted understanding of the belief. So for our children, we must implement this from day one and we are supposed to teach them, showing them the importance of Tawheed and knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once our children, they know about Allah. Once our children, they know, okay, who Allah is and what is the correct concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why are we doing other things? So what happens is parents, they want children to be righteous, to obey the parents and they want to do good. They don't want the children to cheat, lie or use bad words, but they don't tell them the reason why. So in our life, we discipline our life for the sake of Allah. We follow the commandments for the sake of Allah uh, because Allah has told us to do. Once this is instilled in the brain of a human being or a child, then the rest of the things, they just follow and it becomes easier because now we know we have a purpose in life. We're supposed to worship Allah alone and He's our creator. He's the owner of the day of judgment. He's our master and we are supposed to be His slaves and worship Him alone. This, having said this, uh, Excessively, uh, when uh, you know people they glorify, uh, say uh, saints or uh, you know other righteous people, then this also leads to a lot of times uh, shirk, uh, if not uh, uh, you know major, where people you know fall into uh, the aspects and elements of shirk. So remove these distractions and remove these things which can uh, you know make people fall uh, in. Uh, shirk, for example, it's like uh, maybe glorifying or maybe for decoration, uh, as some people, they keep idols in the house for decoration. We as Muslims, again, we say the moderate path, we can uh, keep decoration uh, like flowers and uh, paintings of like maybe mountains and sky and this and so on and so forth, but not things like uh, idols or human beings, like statues, yeah, statues and these things. So basically, which can be, uh, again, the child, he might, he's always in a learning process. He might take certain things which we can't even imagine. So therefore, protecting our children from shirk, this is the primary uh, condition for tarbiyah, for upbringing the children. The second advice which is mentioned, Surah Luqman, uh, it mentions that, and we have enjoined on man to be dutiful and good to his parents. His mother bore him in weakness and hardship upon weakness and hardship and his weaning is in two years. Give thanks to me and to your parents and to me is the final destination. So here uh, and in other verses where we see that the importance of obedience towards parents has been emphasized in Islam uh, and it has been emphasized to a great extent where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that obeying the parents is a very important duty upon the children, irrespective of their parents being good or bad or whatever the case might be. And if we as parents want our children to be obedient, we have to adopt uh, that methodology where we show them that this is an element of Islam and where you're supposed to obey your parents and parents they have a higher status in Islam. Uh, Having said that, you know, there is one aspect which must be discussed is that why do children not uh, sometimes uh, respect their father or their mother? One of the uh, major aspects of this is that when uh, the husband and wife, they don't respect each other in front of the children. When the husband, uh, you know, disrespects the wife or the wife disrespects the husband in front of the child, the respect of parents goes away from the, so the fighting and cribbing and nagging, everything happens in front of the children and they're observing. And we think he's just four years or he's just five years, but that's not the case. And subhanAllah, recently uh, there was a, a case which, uh, you know, I got to know where a child who's about five to six years of age and the, the couple was basically fighting in front of uh, them. They were having some dispute. After the child after the father went, the child goes up to the mother and tells him, why don't you just call the police and give him to the police? This is what a five-year-old child, and we think, yani, they, they can't think, uh, you know, big, they can't think on other lines. They're just kids with some toys. So for us to instill obedience for parents, number one is that the couple, the parents, they need to fix this, that, okay, there might be some times where things have to be discussed, 
or there is a dispute, do it privately, not in front of uh, the children. The children must see their parents uh, with great respect. And once the husband respects his wife in front of the children, automatically they will have this respect and obedience towards uh, the mother. So it's not like the child is asking for something uh, and the mother says no. And then all of a sudden the father walks in and the father says, no, 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 give it to him. Here, this is uh, a contradiction. And the child will now, uh, you know, uh, the, the respect of his mother will go down and he thinks, okay, no, my father, he's going to give it to me and so on and so forth. And similarly, speaking ill about the uh, other person in front of the child or to the child, you know, we're saying your mother is like this or your father is like that. These are things which are not healthy and these are things which will ultimately make him disobedient towards the parents. So obedience to the parents is obligatory. The Prophet ﷺ also mentioned uh, in one of the hadith that one of the major sins is to disrespect your parents. So if the teenagers, those who are watching us, uh, know that you know respecting your parents is of utmost priority in Islam and it has to be uh, fixed if uh, due to some reasons or due to lack of knowledge, people did not know about it, then they must start implementing it from now itself. Whether yeah, because the... I mean, it's, like you mentioned, it's not, it's not just for teenagers, it's even for adults. Some people, may, they may think now, I'm an adult, I'm a big man, I'm 40, I'm 35, I'm 50. I'm a, you know, they still have to have that respect for the parents. And as you mentioned, not only in the hadith, in the Quran, Allah says that he ordained that you worship him alone. And to be good to your parents. So you can see that after Tawheed, Allah mentions being good to the parents. Which also shows us what? That to be, not to be good to the parents or to be rude or to treat them badly is one of the worst of sins that someone can do. That's right. Uh, so this is one element. Advice number three which uh, is given by Luqman is be mindful of every action whether small or big. This is what uh, he teaches his child. And, and this is, again, why, why is it so important? So that our, our children, they know, okay, that uh, whether small or big, we have to be cautious and aware of our actions. This is making the person aware of his actions and accountability. And this is, again, very important because if there is no accountability and if there is no cautiousness of actions, then a person might do anything. And similar is example, whether in... Uh, an organization or in a university school everywhere if there is no accountability then people might do anything so to make our children aware about the accountability and about being cautious of whatever they do small or big and as Allah mentioned in Surah Zilzal that whatever of small deed one does he will see it on the day of resurrection whether good or bad whatever small good deed he does he will see it and whatever small bad deed he does he will see it on the day of resurrection everything is recorded and our children must be uh, told about this and taught about this because they should not feel okay uh, privately I'm, I'm lying so this is okay or privately I'm doing this sin this is fine once we teach them that every action is recorded every action you have to be aware whether small or big then they will themselves be in a position you know this is like a modeling where you are training the brain of the child to be cautious of their actions and later on they will be in a position you know uh, as leaders to judge what is right and what is wrong and this is what we ultimately want our children to be uh, as parents we cannot be with them all the time this is the practical reality uh, so they go out when they grow up they'll get married they'll have children uh, sometimes they have to go out for studies or they have to go uh, you know for work so once we have this foundation laid and once we instill this in the uh, you know, uh, brain that you are accountable and be cautious, then we will put them in a position you know, of selecting the right from the wrong. And this is something which is very uh, beneficial advice. Advice number four, which Luqman gave is establish Salah. And again, we know after Tawheed is Salah. And amongst the Sahaba, they considered uh, you know, leaving the Salah as uh, you know, uh, a form of uh, kufr and uh, it is something which uh, we must teach our children from a very young age. Bring them to the masjid, let them sit there, let them be there, 
uh, let them uh, uh, pray with you. Let them go with the father to the masjid. Not that once you become 15 or 20, then we tell them, okay, come to the masjid. And then they don't come. Then we beat them. Then we do other things. And then we are uh, you know, in depression that my child is not coming to the masjid. No, it has to start from the beginning. And we know, of course, that the, the prayer is the, it was called by the Prophet as the uh, Imad al the, 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 the foundation of the religion. And uh, we know that on the Yom al Qiyamah, if someone's prayer is intact, as the hadith says, all of their deeds will then be intact. But if their prayer isn't intact, then all of their deeds won't be intact. That's right. Advice number five, when we see the advice of Luqman, was that enjoin good and forbid evil. Again, this is a beautiful quality. Like if a person, he understands this, and if a child has this in him, then he's, uh, yani you don't need to worry. So when he sees something bad, he forbids evil. And if he uh, <coughs> maybe mixes with his relatives, friends, he enjoins good. That he should pray Allah, he should worship Allah alone, and he should be dutiful to parents. So this quality, basically, it has to be in all of us uh, as Muslims. But then where does this start from? As we see Luqman is advising to his son for children that you should enjoy good and you should forbid evil. As, as we can say, it's not just for the, uh, the scholars. You know, don't think once he becomes 30 years, then he will become a scholar, write books. and No, it has to start from uh, the beginning. Advice number six, which he gave to his son was that be humble, being humble and don't be arrogant. This is the advice. And again, uh, we see arrogance leads to a lot of sins, even uh, kufr and even shirk in many cases, as we see in the case of Fir'aun, he was arrogant, he rejected. Uh, and similarly, for our children, we must make them uh, humble and we must tell them that whatever you have from the blessings or money or wealth or uh, you know, good house, education, food, be humble and adopt this quality of humbleness. And we, we not going far, the best example of uh, humbleness, of righteous character is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Give uh, our children the role model of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was successful. He was a messenger of Allah. He had uh, people, you know, uh, at his one command, people would do anything. But he was the most humble human being uh, on this planet. So being humble was his advice. And last but not the least, uh, he advised his son uh, about, shun this is also related to arrogance, uh, about shunning arrogance and uh, not walking boastfully or not, uh, you know, uh, shouting and talking loudly. Again, this is an aspect, you know, where once people are in authority, uh, you know, they, they look down upon people or, you know, they shout at people, humiliate people and, you know, walking in arrogance and boasting about the things. So we see this act of uh, this uh, yani element of humbleness has to be instilled in our children. And we see that all of these seven advices which are given by Luqman to his son, basically it covers all the elements of our life which we are living. Uh, for us uh, as parents to make our children better, inshallah, we must take these seven advices, implement in our life and expect goodness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakallah khair for coming on. And some good tips definitely for all of us to take away with us, inshallah, and implement. And until next time, inshallah, same time, same place. I'll leave you as always. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.